remember being so paranoid. Like even here, I was on bang on time for this. We, like if you're five minutes late with him, you were you were late. So I remember lads who slept in. I think they missed their alarm. Reese Ruddock and another lad named Sheridan. I remember they were like really considering driving their car into the river because they were like because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to have to deal with the consequences of being late. Like, honestly, they said they were that close to crashing it or and or a river. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload podcast with Max Leave and Ryan Wilson. Later on the show, we'll be joined by Irish international John Cooney. But first, Sleeve, both the best with the weekend off, right? How did how do you boys get on? Was it weekend off? Yeah, well, I had a very leisurely weekend, very lazy, just chilled. It was quite, it was quite, quite delightful. Actually, Friday got weird. Went to some weird places in Bristol. Oh, nice. The Mines of Moria nightclubs. Oh well, my God, what, what am I doing here? But other than that, yeah, it was pretty sure. <laughs> I had a, I had a, um, a charity dinner. I went to Beats and Cancer, Beats and Cancer charity dinner and uh, Rude Hullet was a speaker. Very funny. Like that. That was good. Thursday night. And then that's why I was asking if I had a weekend off. I didn't. I've got four children. So it was harder work than playing a match. It was um, horrible. What about you, Marky boy? You've been working? Uh, no, doing the classic <laughs> looking after two kids, tucking into the old Eurovision antics. You boys, you we were watch, shit for once. You watch Eurovision. My, yeah, wife, my wife fucking loves it. She loves oh. it. Seriously. Do people actually watch that? Yeah, I saw a load of it on Twitter. I was like, yeah, yeah, catch me Twitter. dead watching that, bro. No, people were actually genuinely enthralled by what was really? going on. I was like, there's no chance. It's bizarre because you're firstly the the commentary's amazing, right? It's Graham Norton and it's always hilarious, like it's properly funny. And then you just go in and just it's just loads of like cultural traits coming out, and you know you're shouting at the telly, you're booing, and it is actually quite amusing. And we weren't shit for once, but obviously didn't win. But yeah, I've just always thought it was a a bit of a weird thing. Like I've never heard of anyone on there. I think our last one was Katrina and the Waves that were that were pretty good. Do you remember them? Right. Anyway, got me thinking. Most talented singers that you boys have come across uh, in the changing rooms. I wondered where this was going. I was. Yeah, I, I, there's I, always a reason, Ryan. Um, the most talented singers I've ever been around. Uh, the most talented musician was Salala Mapasua. He could play any instrument, like Mozart. It was weird. He just picked something up and he could do it on the spot. Grand piano, guitar, ukulele, probably the same thing. He could even blow a horn properly. Um, the best singers, Salossi Tang and Thakambao. Those Samoan, those Polynesian voices are just gifted, aren't they? And then um, Jan Thomas at Bristol, unbelievable. It's like Bruno Mars vibes. Yeah, this is weird coming out of that huge, like, bison of a man. But yeah, unbelievable singer. Oh, Nice. Mm-hmm. Right, you're a magician. Uh, magician, you of course on the field, but a musician off the field as well. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. No, obviously we um we had that band, didn't we? We set up a band at Glasgow. Oh, your true. rendition with the ukulele to me it was beautiful. I was like, Thanks. he's actually got something going on it. Yeah, it was awesome. No, we we set up the scrum bags, didn't we, for charity? We did it uh, just before COVID hit, and we went. We did a gig at the Hard Rock, twelve. 12 songs, no, 12 or 14 songs. And we had a mixture of all the boys on different things. But it got really serious. Like, my missus was raging by it. And she was like, are you joking? Every day off, I had to go and, we had to go to the studio and practice. And I absolutely loved it. It was amazing. But yeah, we, we hard rock, 500 people, raised a lot of money for charity. But there's, um, there's a few boys I'll play with. Ratu Tangive, who's still in now. Oh, my sweet soul. Sweet, sweet soul. He's, uh, Australian for gin, so but he's just got it. And Aki Seely, oh, down yeah. at the Dragons now. He was here, prop. Honestly, like like you said, yeah, it's he those boys. Picked up yeah. the piano and then it, it just leads on. So he can play the guitar, <laughs> he can play the flute. If we jump on the bagpipes, he'd probably be able to do that. But no, no, no. but again, like sweet sweet soul, mother. Uh, well, I remember. I never forget. We were built, doing this house up and. Uh, we had the Traeger on inside the house. I was living in it as like derelict. And uh, we all sat around and my brother-in-law's hard as nails, right? And we all sat around as Aki's there singing away. And I look over, I was like, Steve, you're right, mate. And he's like, yeah. Brought tears to the man's eyes. Like it was that, 
<laughs> it was that beautiful. And that beautiful. Voice of an like, angel. Like Step Brothers. <laughs> Seriously. Oh. <laughs> Seriously. But no, he, he was good. Brilliant. Uh, right, we better chuck in some rugby now as well and mm. getting to the, the proper business end of, of the European rugby competitions. Uh, it's touched on the Challenge Cup. Both English sides knocked out by French opposition. Uh, Ryan, a sort of valiant Wasp performance, not really enough to uh, to overcome Lyon losing 2018. Who, who impressed you from, from, from those sides? I'll be honest, after Nick White bagged it, I thought, is there any point in watching it? <laughs> You're the 21st team in the in the competition. <laughs> it made me think, what's the point in watching it? So, yeah. uh, so I just turned it off and, and thought, no, all right, I'll just watch Champions Cup. So Max is going to have to grab this one. I only watched two long Saris, actually. On the 20, uh, yeah, no, it was a good game. Uh, we played well. Joel Kapoku, he was unbelievable for the big fellas. The, uh, Fafa Fanua, mate, there were so many good uh, performances. I thought Wasps were good as well. Um, it was a really tight match. I thought Wasps had many opportunities to win it, but Leon just coming back with that, with that comeback grit. Um, yeah. So thoughts on Joel Kapoku? I mean, you know, he's doing really well in in the, in the, in the top Qatars. Uh, you know, an Englishman doing well and and looks like a bright future. Yeah, he looks. Yeah, he he's just a bit of a freak, isn't he? Like unbelievable athlete, moves incredibly well for a big fella. He's really good. Like, I think he needed that opportunity, though. I think uh, at Saracens, it was jam packed when it. Um, he got some. Obviously, he was lauded as like something great coming through the ranks. But now that he's finally got an opportunity at top Cattles, full on, it's only going to make him better. Like, it clearly, has forged him into a much better rugby player. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he does because obviously, if he wants to come and play for England, which I imagine he does, being such a young man. Um, it'll be interesting to see where he goes to, to achieve that. But right now, he looks very much at home in Lyon. I did actually see a bit of the Lyon game, I'll tell a lie, because I was laughing at when the kicker was taking the kicks. How it's so different over there. The, the noise they make, they're no one here, they're like, respect the kicker, everyone's silent. Why? What's the point? I think I think the crowd should be allowed to shout as much as they want, I think. But who who, that's just the crowd, isn't it? Is people in the crowd policing that? Like, you know, you get the jobs worse. Like, shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> the jobs worse. Huh? No, it's not always the jobs worse. It's usually yeah. the, oh, the, why old, you know? the old yeah. money. It's yeah. the old money, not the jobs worse. They're like, how dare you? How dare you? You unscrupulous vagabonds. Yeah, they're like, shh. Yeah, like that's classic wreck, actually. That's the classic recreation ground. Yeah. We Dead should time. try and like find... Like a mausoleum. And if you like, if you like got up to get a drink sit down (laughs) we should try and find a club where we can get it them just to be the first club to just make noise when the kickers are taking kicks yeah I I like that just like full of vuvuzelas and everything yeah I'm gonna gonna try and implement that at Glasgow you've got to try and do it for us who who gets on top first yeah I'm I don't yeah It, it, it gets somewhat raucous here but I know what you mean yeah, I think we well, there's to... a very, very raucous other semi final, and, and Owen Farrell in that one was getting booed a heck oh, of a lot every time gosh. he was trying to take a kick. He got, he got angry, uh, didn't he? The Stephen Jones in the Times called, I think the headline was Saracens fought to Toulon in one of the greatest club games, which I thought was was interesting. But what what were your thoughts on that? Did you did you sense that it was it was a, a classic in the making? Uh I don't know about the greatest club games ever. I mean, I know it was that, pretty good though. There was some awesome players involved. Good, good environment. It was a yeah. decent game. That's what he was. I think being in the yeah, middle yeah. of that, he was saying like it was just. Oh was right, kind of okay. Like, yeah, I was going to say the actual game because I mean, the one thing for sure, it was definitely better than Larachelle Rasset, which was yeah, not the best, but um, yeah, it's a pretty cool place to go and play. I still haven't managed to play over there. You played over in too long. Yeah, I played at Stadmo. Pilu pilu pilu. Yeah, that, it seems like a pretty awesome place to go and oh, play. It's now. naughty. It is naughty. Yeah. But you I can look- imagine there's been bigger days there. And, you know? Yeah, but they looked, they looked, they looked, it was a bit of a renaissance. So they looked very untouchable, didn't they? They looked very naughty. I thought they looked class. Yeah, that they were. Right. was throwing their weight around readily. And then, of course, Big Gabon just dominating. My God. Just continuing his mad Six Nations form. 
absolute freak show. You see him over the ball? Men Who are you talking about? Sorry. Villiers. Yeah, Villiers. Yeah. Oh. Mate, unbelievable. Absolutely outstanding player. Yeah, he's very, very gifted. And just, he looks just hard, intense, doesn't he? Just everything's competitive. But you'd be like one of those blokes you'd hate to fight. He'd probably kill you with his teeth or it's like a pinky thing. And then on the other other wing, Wynacola, who was unbelievable. Oh, too. my God, that finish was hilarious. And then they got Colby. Colby's just chilling out somewhere. But he's coming back. Oh, it's a, it's an absolute freak show. If that pack keeps getting them good ball. <laughs> yeah. But Carbonell was good, I thought. Justin Bieber of France. He looked good. He looked good. I thought he was really, uh, really good. Parise still going at 40 years old. I know. Link playing. Still Link playing home. like an absolute samurai. He was class. Delighted to be joined on the show by Irish International, uh, John Cooney. Uh, John, how are things? Oh, good. Thanks for having me. We have a, a big game this week. It's our, our last game of the regular season. So, and we need to make sure we win it. So, we got a home quarter. So, and we had a big train day today and everything's feeling pretty good. How's my old mate, Dan? Very good. Yeah, he's doing well. He, uh, did, did you he tell him you were coming on here? Nah, not yet. I'll tell him after. It depends how it goes. Yeah, he'll be raging. But I'll fucking tell Wilson to fucking stop making jokes about me. You <laughs> might listen to see what I say. <laughs> oh, he's a good man, Dan. I like him. Dan McFarlane. He is. I, I had him in Connacht originally and oh, he was a forwards coach then and I probably said about two words to him and then since he's come here now with him being head coach I, I correspond with him a lot more so it kind of changed the vibe I was scared of him in Connacht but now yeah we get on really well oh, He's a good boy, he's a funny man eh? Yeah, I'd say he told I was probably crap back then anyway so he barely speak to me How's, um, how's big Robbie Herring? Good, yeah. Actually, we we're talking about you today. He said, he "Oh, made- really? Oh, he's a fascinating individual, isn't he?" Yeah, I'm- he was. He said he couldn't think of any good stories, though. Oh uh, no, yeah, he's got no doubt on me, but I have one on him. So, yeah. our first day in the academy, um, we we're all doing our skinnies. You know, it is. Everyone's a bit nervous. Yeah. Oh my god, professional rugby. Rob Herring's just got off the plane from South Africa. He's a bit, it's a bit like, all over the place. Anyway, we all get, we <laughs> they all get our skinnies off, so we have to like take our clothes off. Matt Garvey gets up there, blokes eighty percent dough. He's like a human pork scratching, and then <laughs> you've got um you've got me, so I do mine all good. A little bit shredded, one yeah. percent fat, <laughs> shreddy shreddy Kruger. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Herring starts undressing all the way down to the tiniest wire front briefs ever, and he's like just. This doughy, doughy, sloppy, like eighteen year old. It was so oh, I felt so bad. the same to be honest. Still a doughy. Yeah, he's still a bit doughy and he a bit shrimpy yeah. gets up. He there. thinks he's in good nick though. That's the problem. He'll look and he'll be like, I've an ab there. And it's just Yeah, boring. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it was so good. He, gets, he starts like blushing, gets all red and shit. Like he's delusional. He actually thinks he's in decent nick. Yeah. No. Nah. Never, never. Good man. He's a great man, though. Wonderful bloke. Golden yeah. human. Just moral compass points north, unlike Ryan Wilson's. <laughs> Other <Other> opposites. <laughs> oi, oi, hold on. <laughs> uh, so we, we obviously, John, we're going to run through your your amazing career and and also just a few things for what's going on this season. Yeah. Uh, but there was there was an interesting article on on Rugby Pass uh, debating whether. Johnny Sexton is the greatest Irish player of all time. Ooh, controversial. What? What are your What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think with what he's obviously achieved, going on now to try and win five European Cups, um, it's I think a testament to his ability to keep playing at, at what nearly thirty seven. So, um, there's obviously good company there with Brian O'Driscoll, Paul O'Connor, etc. Um, it's one of those things quite hard to quantify. Obviously, everyone's different positions. He's an out half. He's a goal kicker, um, kind of more of a playmaker. Whereas, you're not going to pick O'Connell as the best ever because he's second row, um, and they just kind of saunter around. So yeah, it, <laughs> for what he's achieved so far, um, and he's still going. In fairness to him, um, so yeah, who'd be your play. top three, John? And um, well, I was lucky enough to play with O'Driscoll, so for me, it probably would be him. But as I said, I was more into football to be honest when I was younger, so I don't really look back at Irish players and be in awe of too many of them that I was grown up thinking they're the, the bee's knees. And probably the only rugby player that I did do that was probably Johnny Wilkinson, just his ability to kick a ball when I was younger. So when I always get asked who was my favourite rugby player growing up, I didn't really have one, to be honest. As probably Michael Owen as a footballer was just my my idol. Which See is- that Leinster pack, that Leinster pack at the moment, make anyone look good, wouldn't they? 
Yeah, they're on, like they're Ty Furlong was playing like Dan Carter. I thought in the weekend he was by far the best player in the field, and then he went off. And yeah. you can't defend that. A, a forward's ability to take it to the line and pull it out the back like that. It's nearly impossible to defend. Yeah, that's what it is, isn't it? It's that interchange between them and Sexton, that like front three off the touchline. Like you just don't know if they're carrying or if they're going to be thrown out the back. It just makes them so hard to defend against. Well, was, the uh, time you get it wrong, he does carry and you get ahead of the ball. Or the, yeah. oh. the one he tipped on to Doris went straight through. So there's, you guess and you go out the back and he'll tip it on. You don't yeah. play it out the back. So it's actually <laughs> impossible to defend that. What, what were your thoughts though on that dominant display against Toulouse from, from Leinster? Yeah, I, I was very impressed. Obviously, it hurts to say that. I mean, might be from Dublin, but played for Ulster now the last five years. So I'm sure it's the same with Ryan and given any uh, good news for, for Edinburgh, given them plaudit. So, yeah, I, I, I did think they looked the strongest in the competition. I thought I watched the La Rochelle game. And, and at the moment, obviously, Lens are going to be favourites. Again, in France on any game, you never know. But I think they look pretty impossible to beat there. Um, and hopefully now we'll get them in in this league. So, and we're going to have to have a good performance to try and beat them. Are this Leinster team one of the best teams that you ever played against? We've actually this year we we played them twice and we we won both games. But it, it was it was uh, kind of a bit of a no, <laughs> yes they are, but we beat them yeah. both times. No, it was a mixed selection. I I don't think they had their their full strength. And um, we played them away in the RDS, and they had probably about 50, 60 percent of their their Irish players, but. Um. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's just so many good players and teams gone by. I was lucky enough when I was coming through to play on that team at O'Driscoll, Easton Nasewa, um, Jamie Heastip, all, all the players who were playing for Ireland, and I think that was up there as well as one of the best. They won it back to back. Um, where they won one and then won the European Challenge. Rocky, that year, and then Rocky so. El Samira. That was that yeah. was a good one as well. Yeah, yeah. that was the year before, and then my year we won yeah. it. I played what, 12 minutes in the final and got my medal and got out of there. So I was quite lucky. So, um, <laughs> talk, yeah, made my debut. Talk us through that. Come on, talk us. What an amazing debut. Like, incredible no. European debut. It was weird. It was bizarre. So I was, what, 20, I think. I ju- I broke my jaw six weeks earlier playing AAL, which is the Irish League. So I was playing for Lansdowne and that. Broke my jaw, lost about six kilos. And I just came back training that week and I look over and I was like, boss is down on the floor and Owen Redden's down on the floor. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. I'm going to have to start here. I'm going to have to play all these games. I've never even played in Europe. I was five caps for Leinster and I'd been hauled off at half time in one of them. So I wasn't really going great in my Leinster career. And I remember looking over, I had to do all their plays, the big training day of the week, the main one where you need your best players. And I had to do it. And I did fine, got through it all. And then the night before I was, I was rooming with uh, Dominic Ryan. Isaac Boss was saying, tell, told me he was fine. And Owen Redden was fine. So I was like, oh, grand. So I was up till probably 12-1 chatting away not thinking anything about it and my mum as well goes to every game and she had booked a holiday to Spain so I was like oh head away there's no way I'll be playing and then I'm in the warm up kind of facilitating other lads catching box kicks passing and Joe Schmidt starts running over to me he's like you're on the bench I was just like oh Jesus I'm making my debut in Europe in the Heineken Cup final here um, but it was one of them it was, it was so bizarre and I never expected that I kind of felt like I couldn't really mess up like 80,000 people in Twickenham I just told the feck it, I was come on and try and do my best. And we we're lucky we're up by 20 points. And it was actually against Ulster now who I play for. Um, and I got on for, yeah, about 15 minutes. That was pretty cool. How, how, was, the, how was the celebration that night? Dave Carney um, was getting piss tested and took like five hours. So by the time we got back, everyone had gone home. There was nothing <laughs> to celebrate. And then the next day, I think I was putting a taxi by like nine. and was in bed. So I kind of blew up the second day. I got a bit too excited. Didn't even make it out. So was that in London? Do you have that in London? You fly back. Yeah, we went straight back to Dublin. And um, but th- that's it. We were waiting around Twickenham for like four hours, and then by the end, by the time we got back, it was yeah. There's not much crack anymore. He kind of ruined the night for everyone. Was it Crystal's Copperface Jacks? Is that is that was that the go-to then? That was the plan. But honestly, it was like four a.m. and everyone, had, all the partners, all the family had just gone home, and there was just kind of a bit of an anticlimax, but made up for it the next day. Fantastic. Let's uh, let's move back to John and and those sort of days of sharing a changing room with the likes of of of, of Bod, Sean O'Brien, uh, Heaslip. But when you you sort of first came into that squad, how, how nerve wracking was it? Yeah, even I think Brad Torn was there one of my years as well, which he was incredibly impressive. And um, just how he got on with it, his professionalism, 
nobody could go near him when he was doing his own gym. It was just leave him be. He, uh, he was so used to, I think, with Crusaders, they gym on their own or something. But it was so impressive, the work he got through. But, yeah, because I was coming, say, whatever, out of school, being from Dublin and stuff. It, I don't know. I didn't find it as daunting. I think when you're you're coming up through the, the ranks, it's a little bit different, I think, when you move to a club and you hear the so- stories about like, people and stuff like that. But, yeah, I think I was a bit naive, to be honest. As I said, I got taken off at halftime my first ever game for Leinster. So I think I was... Yeah, naive to what actual professional rugby was like. I remember thinking, oh, Jesus, this is way harder than I thought it'd be. So that kind of rattled me. I think if you can come back from that when you're Shepherd Hook, you, we lost by, I think, by 30 points to the Ospreys away, and um, which Lencer at that time to do that was was pretty poor. So, yeah, that kind of, I remember with Joe Schmidt after the game, nearly in tears, being like, this is half, not half as easy as I thought it would be. Um, so I think that kind of humbled me anyway. Yeah, tell me more about Brad Thornwood. No one was allowed near him in the gym. <laughs> Well, like he 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 lift like one sixty one seventy on the bench, but no one he didn't want to spot ever, and then he'd just jump in and do core and stuff in between every set, and he was stacked and ripped, and he was so impressive. He wore his hat. He went out trained every day, and yeah, he was just his professionalism was kind of. Oh, bro, he'd be the early. Oh yeah, no, he's the man. Are you laughing at his light weights in comparison? No, yeah, I wish. Do you know Tom Sexton? Yeah. Oh my god! So when I was at the Rebels with him, he just got he just come from Leinster, obviously, and he was he could do the most amazing impression of Brad Thorn, but he also spoke about him like you. But I was wondering where that voice came from. Like, is that is that normal? Man, it must be from rugby league. I think he might have got. Yeah. there's something wrong with his larynx, isn't there? Yeah, I think it was so deep. I'd say back then you could literally carry with your yeah, forearm. leave with the forearm. Just oh man, yeah, it just adds to his like mystique doesn't it it makes him sound even harder and nuttier in fairness to him so he came over he had won the world cup he'd won basically everything and they made him play for Leinster A against well I don't think they made him I think he wanted to play for Leinster A against Connacht Day and he was happy out after winning all these things the 36 37 maybe even more was he like 38 he plays for Leinster A against Connacht Day puts in a great 50 minute shift happy out not a bother most players would turn their nose up at that I remember thinking fair play to him for for not having such an ego that he couldn't play back in Leinster. Yeah. Eh? What a legend. John, you obviously came through, you came through the academy at Leinster. Yeah. Mate, what, what, what are they doing that's working so well there? Like, how is it? They're just producing unbelievable talent. They've got some good rugby schools in Leinster, in Dublin, haven't they? Yeah. It's, looking back now, it's actually, their quality of the teams was so good. So when I came up, I think there's only one player still there from my academy. There was me, Madigan, Noel Reed, uh, like Dominic Ryan, Andrew Conway, Brendan Mackin, the amount of players we had, and I think not, probably 95% of all either moved on to other teams, like Conway plays for Ireland and Munster now, because the team was so good at the time, whereas then there was a kind of lull for a couple of years, and now all that academy is coming true um, and to fruition now. So that's the kind of other flip side of it when your team's doing so well, and you have these academy players that are quality, quality players, but they can't get into the team. And I'd say something quite similar again could happen now where these current academy crop of players can't get into the team because it's so good and they might have to move elsewhere to to get game time. Because Jack McGrath, he, I think he was there as well. Jordy Murphy, like these are all players that came through with me and have all left to, to go elsewhere. They're doing something right over there, aren't they? They're definitely doing something right. We've got um Killer, Killing Rid and yeah, yeah. At, at Glasgow and he was just explaining to us like how well the academies work with the the lens to set up over there, but Jesus, man, some of the players coming out of there at the moment, you just think, oh, they're just going to get better and better, aren't they? Their quality of athletes, like some of the stuff I remember we used to do there, like even something as simple as plyometrics, but lads were jumping ridiculous numbers and they'd spend a good 40 minutes doing it. And then I remember going to Connacht and I don't think I did a hurdle or plyo in about six years. And my CMJ went from whatever mid fifties to about 30. So um, I think it's just the quality of training. They're always kind of advancing things a little bit more than them now. Well, B- Bernard Jackman said that even for some people in the Leinster squad, it was it was impossible to make like the Tuesday training session, let alone the sort of match day squad. Is, is that right? I mean, how dark did it get? Well, I spent, yeah, probably about three years on the wing. So that's kind of why I back myself in any position at the moment. I don't mind when I get thrown on the wing in the middle of a game. I Yeah, I think it's the kind of hardship of it all. And um, even speaking to players now, and obviously I've had a good couple of years and I'm speaking to younger lads and be like, well, mate, I had to do, I remember playing for Connacht A against Germany 
I'm like, well, Jesus, I've come a long way from playing Germany for Connacht Day or <laughs> playing Ponty Preed every year. Um, so you kind of have to do it when you're younger. You have to play on the wing for a couple of years. You have to get that little bit of game time that you can. So for me, I had Red and Boss, who were both Irish internationals. Um, and when one didn't play, the other would play or, or vice versa. So I found even if I was playing well, I probably wouldn't play most of the season. So it's it's kind of difficult in that regard. But you, you do what you can. You, you train away and uh, yeah, wait for an opportunity. Be patient. Obviously, you know, amazing memories from, from your perspective, titles and what, what you know what you won when you were there. But was there a little bit of frustration your time at Leinster and hence the move to, to, to Connacht? Yeah, well, probably looking back, yeah, it was a little bit frustrating. I think the turning point for me was when Matt O'Connor came in. So under Joe, I actually was, I think I had 22 caps um, over two, my first two seasons, which is pretty decent for a young lad and was lucky enough to play in a couple of finals where the next season... Um, and Ren got injured, so I played in the Amlin a good bit when we won that. So I was lucky enough to win all those things. But once he came in, I think as a player, sometimes, you know, when a coach doesn't warm to you. And um, yeah, I I get surgery on my shoulder. And I remember him ringing me and asking, do I want to go on loan to Connacht? And I was actually in Mayo, which is a, a county in the west of Ireland, Connacht, because my mum's from there. So um, I just remember thinking this lad's trying to get rid of me. But um, kind of reflection, I was like, actually, screw it. I'm going to go there. I'm going to hopefully get game time. And in my head, I was thinking, come back and, and keep playing for Leinster. But um, I remember when I went up to him, be like, okay, I'm off now. He was like, yeah, okay, enjoy. And then after that, I kind of realized, okay, well, now here, I'm not going back here. Um, and then I started actually playing real well for Connacht, a couple of man matches. It's, it's a bizarre year, if I have to explain it. So I was on loan and I was playing for, obviously for Connacht. Um, but I got a phone call on the Sunday being like, okay, you can come back to us if we need you. So I was just in Dublin and I got a phone call saying, okay, well, you're with Leinster this week. So I had to go back to Leinster that week and I had to play the Dragons. And I came on and actually had my best probably week ever with Leinster because I didn't really give a shit. I was just like trying everything, crossfield kicks, anything. I didn't really care. Came on, grubber kick for a try. We score to go ahead and then we kick it off, concede. We lose to Dragons at home. And then again, after Matt O'Connor was like, you can go back. I go back to Connacht. Who do I play? Dragons again. So I played Dragons back to back. <laughs> With Leinster and Connacht, the week after, I had to go to Rodney Parade and I got man of the match because I was like, well, I played these guys last week, so I knew them well. <laughs> I remember them looking at me being like, what the hell, you just played us last week, but it was bizarre. I, I don't know, am I the only player to play the same team two weeks in a row with two different teams? Was, you probably are, especially down at Rodney Parade as well, because no one was going back there a second time. Oh, it was really just a weird, weird week, because like, I didn't know, am I back there, am I going back to Connacht? I just remember just thinking, I don't really give a shit here, I'm going to do what the hell I want. Uh, that 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 move to Ulster in, in 2017, though, clearly worked absolute wonders. You've been what three time player of the year in the Pro 14 Dream Team, highest point scorer, most assists in the league. Like bang, 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 bang. How did everything kind of turn so in, so incredible for you? I don't know. Again, I I when I signed for Ulster, I saw so I was with Connacht, and I remember hearing about Ruan, and I was just thinking, got onto my agent, be like, that would be perfect, and. I could talk to you all day. So I wasn't a goal kicker really at the time either. So I wasn't, I'd only kicked like twice in probably two games. And I just took it up because we had no kickers one day. So I went out to Connacht and we had, I think two or three kickers injured. And I was like, I can kick because I played football. I was like, give me a chance there. I ended up having to kick it in two games to win kicks. And I got both of them. And then we lost both games. I was like, typical, I get two kicks to win games. It doesn't even matter. And then when I came to Ulster, they're just like, we're going to start using it as a, as a kicker. So I end up being the kicker. But I think I'd only kicked for whatever, like maybe six months. So that obviously gave me like a, a new string to my bow. And, and it was something that I really enjoyed going back to my soccer days. So that, I think, helped me a lot. My first season, we, we were kind of struggling. There was a lot of stuff off the field that was going on. But um, I was just happy with how it all went. Um, and then since then, yeah, I've just really enjoyed it. Working with like Dwayne Peel as a scrum half kind of helped me a lot because as you know, so when there's a coach in your position, he's generally a little bit harder on you because he, he knows what you need to do. So I find he always pushed me um, to kind of get better every week. So I was kind of lucky to have him. You've got the record for being capped the most by three separate provinces in total in Ireland. Incredible record. But for our non-Irish listeners, can you tell us the main differences between the teams? Well, like it was all kind of different eras for me. So obviously that was the star studded Leinster era when I was coming through. And 
I didn't really feel as part of it as I'd like to think. Obviously, I, I was lucky enough to play in a couple of the finals, but I didn't really feel proper part of it. Whereas when I went to Connacht, even though I was injured, it was kind of more of a community type team where the lad playing AL or the fifth choice hooker could go out for, for breakfast or lunch with John Muldoon and, and be treated the exact same. So when we won the, the league with Connacht, the Pro 12, it was then back then, that was definitely probably the highlight of my, my club career because it was just everyone was part of it. And this guy showed my, my shoulder in the final, but it was still probably the best three days I've ever had. So that was kind of more community. And then coming to Ulster, it's quite similar again, that it's, it's that where you feel like you can chat to Rory Best or Charles Piatow and, and feel like you're, you're on equal ground. So it's different now in Leinster. It's a, it's a younger era. I was 20. When you're coming through a, a team at 20 years old and, and back then it was a bit more old school, as I said, I kind of didn't feel really as part of it as I have the last two teams. That was a, yeah, you had some team that year you won the Pro 12 because it came out of nowhere as well, didn't it? Like no, Sure, we had to beat you lads back to back. Remember one day was like 6-3 and then the other one was... Yeah, and one was piss and rain, and one was like a lovely day. Yeah, it was class. I remember our tactic was mental. It was to kick to Stuart Hogg, kick to him, which nowadays would be so stupid. We're like, kick along and let's go get him. And yeah. now when I think about teams, we're, we're so worried to contain people. It was like, kick it to him and let's see what he can do. And that kind of reflected our attitude in Connacht that season was there's definitely better teams on paper, but just the, the team ethos we had was, yeah, okay, well, we're playing good rugby and we're going to go after you. And it was a fitting way. Was was that the year John Muldoon retired as well? Yeah, and he was playing unbelievable. He's probably having the best season of his career. How good for him, eh? And he got to like three hundred caps or something, yeah. wasn't it? Or was it three hundred? Three fifty or something. Yeah, it was a ridiculous amount for the club, most ever for the club, and I think in the league. And they went and went. It was good to see you boys do it that year. To be fair, like everyone was going to do it, but you had a, a yeah, like you said, you could just tell. I remember playing you boys. Was it? Yeah, it was a semi. Was it? We played you last game of the season and we needed to win to come second. Yeah. Uh, if you, you came third. And so then we had to come back over week yeah. after. Yeah. If you beat us, you'd be at home. We were at home then. So we played you then again in the semi the week after again in Galway. Yeah. And it just clicked. It just clicked for you boys, didn't it? So that year was just unbelievable. Just even in the final, we played Leinster. But I remember just looking over and kind of seeing their faces, what, 30 minutes in. And it, Really, I don't know how many games I've played ever against Lancer where you, you just feel like you're going to win the game. I don't think I've ever been that confident. I just think the way we're playing, there's no one could really kind of live with us that year. And then the next year, people kind of understood the way we're playing with the second row in the midfield. And yeah, it wasn't as enjoyable the next year. Because oh. was, it, was it Pat Lamb then when you won it? Yeah. Yeah. Did Pat, did Pat do what he does to these boys down there, make you review a whole game? Like and sit down for an hour and a half, or is it the new thing? We used to, so that year we won it. So if we played on a Friday, we had to come in Sunday evening at like six o'clock and review it. What? And half the team lived in Dublin. So we'd be coming back Sunday, hanging maybe from Night and Crystal, and you'd be going back up at four, whatever, three or four, and you know you have to sit there for a review for two hours. Oh, thank you. Sunday goodness. evening, it was hell. Sometimes on a week off, though, he'll be like, come in Monday, and we'll sign off. Yeah. We had so that do you do that? Yeah, we'll yeah. sign up. Yeah. Uh, Monday, we we'll sign off the game. Friday. That was killer. You get up, you play Friday. Yeah. Look, I get a whole week away. Yeah, but we we'll sign off on Monday. Oh, okay, yeah. four days off. Yeah, yeah. Do the review. Sign off Monday, and then you got yeah. the week off. We'd no, we don't have the week off. Yeah. <laughs> <It's working on. laughs> All right, John. A lot of smiling now, but be honest. Have you had some good run-ins with Ryan over the years? Or. Oh, no. Actually, well, I've had some awkward, like, I don't know will you remember, but I remember playing for Connacht as well. And by far the most embarrassing moment I've had on a rugby field. I've had bad, obviously, like in training or off the field. But I went to box kick in on the Astro. So you obviously play in Scottsdale or whatever. And I went to box kick, but it was piss and rain and windy. And I released the ball, but I slipped. So I just slipped and dropped the ball. And Rob Harley picks it up. And just scores. And I was like, oh my God, this could be all over everywhere. But luckily I was a nobody, so nobody gave a shite. But I remember like <laughs> someone coming over and rubbing my head into the floor. I was just like, oh no. Um, but that was, I it kind of went under the radar. It was really bad. Like I literally just, like I went to boxing and just threw the ball on the floor and they can score. Um, and before that, I remember you last year we played and I, you actually did something very smart. You probably don't think you do too many smart things, but never. It was a ball. <laughs> And like when you're mauling box kicking, you know, the way you can come down the side. Yeah. I remember watching it back after, but lads come around the side of the mall 
and now they can obviously put you under pressure but some lads make it obvious they put their hand up and I see them and I'm going to go okay I'm going to step back to kick but you put your head on somebody else and acted like you didn't care and like you're going for a nap you put your head there <laughs> and just just when I went to box kick you jumped miles in the air and tried charging me down I try and be like how the where the hell did you come from Skin in the game, John Boy. Skin in the game. You didn't, you didn't get me though, sadly, but it was a good effort. Very yeah. good. The old tactic with the Edinburgh boys this week, they love a box kick. But now, see, Mark gets this idea that everyone hates me, but I'm telling you, it's the monster, the monster boys. That's where the hatred comes from. I get on with the Ulster boys. They're yeah, all right. I, I do. You know, do you ever like prime yourself for a player thinking, oh, they might come at me? I was like thinking if you come out, I was going to start slagging you off for just being a podcaster and then not a rugby player. You didn't, you didn't. So I was like, oh, I'll just keep that for another time. But now we're a mate, so I can't really. I'm getting that chat now, right? <laughs> and Connor, again, Connor. Oh, I got him with all the boys at Connor. It was just the, the mouthing and the slagging off from Bundyaki. That was all that yeah, drove yeah. me nuts. And oh, he gets wired, bro. I'm friends with him, obviously, playing there. But I, when I play him, all I hear is, yeah, slot machine. What are you going to do, slot machine? When I'm like, <laughs> oh. He's like, oh, oh, I missed one. He's like, you're not the slot machine now. I was like, shut up, Wendy. There's one game. Yeah, he would drive me mental, like with the constant yeah. just. He loved it, yeah. But yeah, other than that, I think, yeah, Leinster, I think we, you know, it, it would go Munster, Leinster, and then they say Connaught and Ulster. I think we get on, we're all right. So there you are, Mark. Okay, okay. I'm happy to be proved wrong, but okay, we're talking about sort of hatred of things, but not in this particular case. But uh, Max and Ryan loathe the Bronco. Oh, geez. Oh, Are no, you a fan I, of it? I don't know. You're trying to prime me for a story here. I think you are. Um, but no, I actually can't stand it too. Firstly, I think it's a crap fitness test. It's a weird it's fitness stupid, test, isn't it? Stupid. Like I'm actually fit and I just for some reason my lactic acid kills me on that. So yeah. Like, decent, You're a fast like, twitch guy like me. Yeah, You're a fast twitch. I don't twitch. even know what my score is, but it's not bad. It's good. Like but yeah, yeah. I had a bad run in with it one time. So it's Kev Geary who you have now for Oh, I love that guy, man. He's so he, he texted us on a Sunday before we started back for preseason on Monday, but like, do you want to come in for an optional session? I was like, nah, I'm all right. I'll, I'll start tomorrow or whatever. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, just come in. Everyone else come in. I was like, grand. Okay, whatever. So we did an hour of fitness. And then at the end, for this optional session, you have to remember, he goes, yeah, now we're going to do a Bronco. I was trying to be like, oh, no, I just got back from Thailand. I was like, I'm not, not feeling great here. Um, but he was like, oh, come on, do it. I was like, grand. So I started I was like one rep in. He's like, oh, I was like, Kevin, I'm not feeling good here. Like, my stomach's bad. He's like, just go. I was like, okay, go on. Yeah, if you want me to go. So I kept going, got to like rep two. I was like, Kev here, and I'm like, I need to go to the toilet. He's like, go. I, okay, if you want me to keep running, I'll keep going. So I end up going to the toilet in my pants while I was doing the Bronco, thinking that he wouldn't let me go because he meant go to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> I just got back from the Irish tour as well. So I didn't want them to think I'm this international who thinks he's too cool to do a Bronco. So I was like, I'm going to do this no matter what. <laughs> And then I think I was like four reps in. I was like, this is incredibly embarrassing. So I was like, Kev, I can't do this. So I just ran into the toilet and uh, yeah, found a bin. And that was kind oh, of Oh, respect. <laughs> and Man, then he got- do it two days later again. So that was even worse. And I basically finished it. I was heartbroken. Oh, sorry. You, did you finish it with shit in your pants? No, but I was four reps in. And then for some reason, the, the awkwardness of it, and I realized how bad this was. I was like, hey, my masculinity or, or me trying to be this hard man who, who would run with, yeah, whatever in my pants. I was like, I can't do this anymore. While the other players were obviously laughing because I was actually ahead of all of them as well. And I was like, nah, I can't do this. It yeah, he does that though. He loves a like, he loves a surprise Bronco. He goes after a few boys hard. I've had a fear, honestly, a fear of it since. I hate yeah. it. I hate it. Can't yeah, do I'll, it. I'll be scarred after that. Um. John, uh, Kev tells me he used to rest like him and um, Marcel Kazir used to wrestle. For but did you ever see that? I just feel like Marcel Kazir would rip his head off. Marcel's an animal. He's the, yeah. Like I've never seen anything like him. Just that loves running over people. Just absolutely adores it. I remember the first time I played with him. He just goes, "You see me, you play me." I was like, "Yeah, yeah." No, no oh wow. <laughs> Like, he'd just run across everyone and just be like, you give me the ball. I'd be like, yes, sir, whatever you want. He just loved running into people and killing people. I'm sure Ryan's played him. Well, a couple of weeks ago, mate. He's Absolutely. an animal. Steve Roller and everyone. Like us as well. 
Yeah, he's terrifying. Him or know. Dwayne, like who you who you picking if you had they're to pick just, one? They're different. Marcel, just like I said, loves contact, whereas Dwayne obviously has played longer. He he'd be more facilitating yeah. as a number eight. He'd look for me, whereas Marcel, I remember again we we're playing <laughs> Edinburgh and like as an eight you'd know a left hand scrum you're just not picking and going because you can't go anywhere but at East all your man is a hickey Simon Hickey the 10 yeah, come yeah. on and he's small and he just goes let me go I was like no Marcel I can't because I can't go anywhere here he's like no I have to, I have to. I was like well you don't have to run over him he's like I, have I must to. do this oh I have to like negotiate with him <laughs> like, oh, up, please just give me the ball but I'll, I'll find you I'll find you carry I'll get you a scrum and he's like, okay, okay. But I had to negotiate with him just to get the ball off the scrum because he just loved it. Uh, but you're right. Big Dwayne's been through the ringer now. He's he's a bit more smart with it, isn't he? Yeah, but he's like, he's a very smart rugby player like that. Penalty advantage, he'll always get you the ball. And um, small thing, like it's subtle. The first time I ever played with him was to Claremont away. But Pep, even mine, is when a number eight catches a kickoff and decides to run 23 metres. And he'll go a meter outside 22. And there's a nine you can't kick straight out if you want. Whereas he play Claremont, he'd catch it and basically just, I'd be like, stop, stop, stop. And he'd just fall on the line. I just remember thinking, like, I love you. You make me look so much better here by my ability to keep a ball in. Or you have, basically, as a nine, you can kick it to the touchline because it might just go out or might just stay in. But either way, you look good. Yeah, exactly. And it was just a subtle smart that not, obviously, you probably wouldn't, but not many eights have. <laughs> hey, I'm all for that. I'm all for getting near the 22 and just falling over. Yeah, just, I love it. <laughs> you can be my number eight every day then. Uh, John, did um apparently uh analyst at Ulster replayed that clip of Dean Mum fending him back in Super Rugby? Oh jeez. Is that is that true? Is that were you there for that? I don't know if I was there, but I know that hurts him. I remember bringing it up. I think I might have made a joke about it as well, and he didn't like it. Apparently, it's absolutely a no-go. <laughs> I've, I've seen the handoff. But, like, Marcel's a legend. He's one of those oh, right. infectious type of people. Oh, you know, yeah. just full of energy every day. He's like, let's go, let's go. And it's like... Oh, the man. You keep up with him. He's an animal. Like, he's the size he's of his arms. You'd be, you'd be Myron his arms. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely bromance with that guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I love a big Dutchman. They're the best. <laughs> uh, John, let's uh, let's go talk about your debut for, for Ireland. It's against Japan. What, what are your re- recollections of that day? Uh, that, like, I, I could have a million stories for you. So even on that tour, um, so I went on the tour. I just signed for Ulster. I played with Connacht, obviously, that year. I thought I did quite well. Murray went on the Lions tour. So I, I made that tour. Um and everyone in the whole squad had been capped after two games, bar me. So there was like 15 new caps, bar me. I just remember thinking like, why always me or whatever? Why the hell am I not getting my first cap when everyone's out celebrating? And I couldn't go out really because I was like, I can't really come home from here without a cap. When I think it was honestly 15 to 17 new caps. I remember just like being obviously a little bit down. I was trained at 10 and training as well. But that week I trained really well and I got put on the bench. So. I remember thinking, geez, I, I better get this first cap. So I got on for, uh, I think, around 15 minutes. Um, and after, actually, I went, I, I don't think I was going to swap my jersey. Maybe I did. Michael Leach, the captain, gave me his jersey, um, which I thought was incredible because for the captain of Japan, he didn't even want my jersey because my first cap, he gave it to me. So I still have that up in my room, which is pretty cool. So that was a pretty He's nice clearly session. a legend as well. Yeah. Like, what, what we even had the, the know-how. He knew it was my first cap, came up to me and gave it to me. I yeah, it's kind of well after that. Yeah. Okay, so having the pent up frustration of not being able to go on the lash with the seventeen other lads who were yeah. cats newly, talk us through when you finally could. Oh, gee, I, oh feck. yeah, that I end up in a bit, a bit of bother that night. Um, we ended up <laughs> we ended up having like a karaoke night. I think in the middle of Tokyo, which kind of escalated. I think I ended up having to do like we call the nagging, so like two hundred mils of vodka or maybe whiskey and 200 mils of um sake and i'm a lightweight anyway um so i end up getting fairly trashed i think i was wearing like a maid's outfit as well because i had to like serve drinks or something stupid so i end up basically walking around tokyo like that and we were saying the conrad the finest hotel in tokyo i think i lost the whole suit and i would end up walking around my boxers through that hotel <laughs> i end up getting sick all over my hotel room woke up 
um, room with Dave Heffernan and another lad. And I woke up, I was like, was I all right? Was I? He was like, yeah, yeah you're grand. I was, like, oh, brilliant. I was like, what a sound, mate. You didn't make me feel bad. And I went to the toilet and just all sick everywhere. Um, end up getting a scrap, I think, as well. We won't even talk about that, but um, yeah, it didn't really end too well. That's what you need, eh? Like a roommate that doesn't make you feel bad. Nah, you were all right. Like, even though he knows how bad you were. And to be fair, it would have been because you're in Japan and everyone's an absolute stat and out there. Like, the Japanese get absolutely steaming, don't they? Yeah, but there's nothing worse than when you got your roommate and he makes, oh, you're some idiot. You yeah. Oh, you know, he's he's just, ever, yeah. Antagonizing oh, you know, the Everyone's oh. laughing at me at breakfast. So I was like, oh, no, you kind of made me out to be like fine here. And I don't know why people are laughing at me. What did I do? Yeah, uh, said- <laughs> I out then, yeah it wasn't great. You, know. Joe, mean, you were playing under Joe Schmidt, apparently a sort of very weird cat loving man. What, what were the weirdest <laughs> things that uh, you witnessed him say or do as head coach? Who, Joe? Yeah. I wouldn't say, like, with Joe, he was <laughs> very strict and what you had to do i just remember being so paranoid like even here i was on bang on time for this we were like if you're five minutes late with him you were you were late so i remember lads who slept in i think they missed their alarm reese ruddock and another lad named sheridan i remember they were like really considering driving their car into the river because they were like because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to have to deal with the consequences of being late. honestly they said they were that close to crashing it or and or a river um because they didn't want to deal with it so like that with Joe, you, you made sure you're on time all the time. So I'm a stickler now for that. And um, so more, he was just unbelievable for like oh. stuff like that. But I was, I would have said I was kind of scared of him. John, since your debut in 2017, you made the dream team four years running. You lead the tables as all time point scorer in that period. Has there been a bit of frustration with the lack of international opportunities in that time? Who, who's counting anyway? I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you for those I, stats, John. First, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, yeah. It is. I've got eleven caps. Um, probably what ten since I've come to Ulster. Um, so I would have obviously liked a lot more, but I think maybe to my maturity, I would have been pretty pissed off. Kind of my first couple of seasons, and it was always kind of maybe in the squad, maybe not in the squad. It's it's kind of shit position to be in sometimes where you you don't know what you're doing. Summer, you don't know what you're doing. November, and then I'd make a squad, and I wouldn't even make the actual. 22 or 23 at the time so it was frustrating in that way that I was playing as well as I, I thought I was anyway and I'd go down I wouldn't even get a look in for Ireland then you go back and it's quite difficult when you're holding bags for six weeks to then go back and play at the level you were just before it so I always find that I kind of had a hiccup after the kind of six nation squad I make or not make even the world cup I was one of the kind of first five people to get dropped from the squad so I think after that season, I had my best season. So that kind of lit the fire in my belly and to kind of prove the selectors or, or even just myself right because I was real pissed off at how early I got kicked out of that squad for the World Cup. What's your relationship like with Conor Money? Good, actually, because we played... He was a year ahead of me, so I played with him since... I remember we played 20s together, actually. I was a year young and I was sub for him. Um, we've always gone on pretty well. I've played him many a time. Um, I would be a typical nine, you know, nines that just hate other nines, but I've never hated him, to be honest. <laughs> Did you do the 20s World Cup in Japan? I was the year after, so I was Argentina, mm. and we blew up, became ninth or something. Nearly got all our academy contracts ripped off. <laughs> 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 we won the Six Nations, and then we came ninth. As well. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's going to sound like an obvious question. Is the aim, of course, to make it back into the island squad for the World Cup and, and compete for that starting nine shirt? Um, no, probably not for me anymore. Um, kind of last season, I hurt my neck at the end of the season. Um, I had a bad incident with Nandolo's uh, forearm and kind of came out the other side of it quite badly. I was had a neck injury for like three months um, off a concussion. Um, and kind of off that tour, I, I think there's a tour to USA and I didn't know whether I was in or not. So kind of got to reflect a good bit on it and kind of realised that for me now it's it's just all just thinking about Ulster and trying to play well for them and not always worrying about how I go um, because it obviously takes a lot of your energy each week. I would look at all the other nines and I'd be watching how they go and I'd be thinking, okay, well, I've played better than this ad or I've done this better and kind of struggle with the feedback I'd sometimes get when I felt like I was playing as good as them or if not better. So I was kind of sick of always comparing myself. So well, I haven't got a look in anyway, but I, I feel like for me now, it's just concentration on Ulster and not really caring about international rugby, to be honest. 
It Would must you... be more tough, sorry, when obviously everyone from the outside sees it as well, though. Like, because at the time, I remember over the last few years, everyone was looking going, how is he not involved in the Ireland squad? So does that make it tougher? Because I remember seeing it and even get asked questions about it. And we're going, why is this guy not involved? Does that make it harder when you know other people are talking about it? It does. And it does. And it does. And I think it's nice, obviously, for, for other people to be thinking about it. And I get some real nice messages on social media anytime I didn't get picked from people being like, I saw the team or I saw the squad and I saw you're not in. And I was always kind of in awe of, of people taking their time to send me messages like that. Um, but yeah, like there's games where I felt like I was one on one with a person in my position and felt like I had come out completely on top and didn't really matter at a lot of the times. And with lockdown I, I was on fire I was having a season of my life and I was playing with Ireland came on against Scotland and I was playing well when I came on and then lockdown happened I was due to start against France and finally get a start and lockdown happened and then didn't make the squad after lockdown I haven't been a squad since two years later so if anyone's going to be um pretty annoyed about lockdown timing it was me but now I, I've, I've learned to deal with it and like I said earlier I'm just concentrating ulcer but not ideal timing mm. When you when you when you built your case for when you reviewed your other competitors' performances over weekends, would you go back to Faz with that? No, but it was like some of them were blatant. Like one oh, of okay, them, so you were just like politics there. Yeah, like I come out with fucking a few tries and twenty points, and and was still like end pick. So I didn't think I kind of had to. But again, I wouldn't be that type of player who would be calling and conversing with coaches and be like, "Here, this is it," because then they they're gonna think what they want to think and. I was just trying to do as well as I could. Um, personally, my sister said, all you can do is, is play so well that they have to pick in. That's kind of what I did that year with, in Europe and stuff like that. And that was my mantra that season. So then why'd you watch, why'd you watch the other people's games? Just I don't know, for your, I have for to. Your <laughs> and now I don't. Now I'll never really watch yeah, yeah, it anymore. Funny. So that was for my yeah. mental health, probably the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, I was like, I've been watching shitty Munster against like, like Glasgow or somewhere. I had to watch <laughs> On a Friday night, and I could be out doing something. Yeah. Um, yeah, now I wouldn't really be too worried. I wouldn't really watch the other provinces unless we're playing them. All right, oh. brilliant. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time. Sadly, that is all the time we've got left for this week. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. A huge thank you to Ryan. A huge thank you to Max. And uh, a huge thank you to John. Good luck for the rest of the season. And we'll see you all next week. 